All right. Hello, everyone. So happy you joined us. Thank you very much. My name is Susan Soleil, and I'll just do a quick share screen. Uh, um, so we're, we're taking you on a bit of a journey with us. The Charter for Compassion and Pro-Social World have been in deep collaboration for almost a year. And this is a, a webinar to explore that collaboration, share with you some of our insights and projects, challenges and successes. We have some beautiful people lined up to kind of share some of their perspectives. And uh, I, I, I said at the beginning, I, I hope we, it's a road trip that doesn't have too many left turns or right turns. And I'll try to keep everyone uh, on, on the same bus. So I, with that, actually, I'll just show you the road that we're gonna take. Um, this is a, a webinar where we're talking about the deep collaboration of pro-social world and the Charter for Compassion. And there, this will actually be in five parts. Uh, we'll be talking with uh, Jeff and Marilyn from pro-social world and Charter for Compassion. Then we're going to have three lovely people talk about their compassionate communities. Uh, our, the third stop on our road trip will be Marilyn Turkovich talking about compassionate communities in general, some of their needs and challenges and successes. Paul and I will talk about pro-social tools that we want to share with compassionate communities, and then we'll have time at the end for Q&A. So please use the chat box so that uh, we will be able to answer those at the end. Oh, well, you know what? I'll just go to my next slide. Just so you know, it's gonna be Jeff Ganung from Pro Social World, Marilyn Turkovich, and, uh, and then myself, Susan Soleil. All right. Jeff, are you there? Lovely. Oh my goodness. So. Uh, who wants to start? Who whose idea was it to do this this collaboration? It was collaborative. It was a collaborative decision. <laughs> it was a collaborative. I've I've been uh, so my name is Jeff Janum, and I'm the managing director for Pro Social World, which is a nonprofit organization like the Charter, and I've been a fan and advocate of the Charter for many many years. And uh, Pro Social World is a relatively recent nonprofit. We're less than three years old, so there were new kids on the block. And it's grounded in three sciences the, the work of a Nobel Prize winner, Eleanor Ostrom, um, uh, David Sloan Wilson, evolutionary science, uh, Paul Atkins, who's on the call today, and Stephen Hayes, contextual behavioral science. These sciences have combined together to essentially um, offer a playbook for cooperation. It's grounded in science and it's repeatable. And this experiment that uh, Pro Social World and the Charter for Compassion are engaged in is actually quite profound because what we're doing is experimenting with what it might be like for two organizations to work together like an organism. Um, in a deeply cooperative way, because for you know, cooperation to scale, it needs compassion. Um, but it's not enough to just be compassionate. Um, groups uh, need to learn how to cooperate together. And so that's what we're exploring. And we have some experiences and you know, kind of case studies that we've worked on with uh, Charter for Compassion uh, network members over the course of the last year that uh, we're gonna share together with you and invite those that are you know, on the call and your teams and communities into further engagement into this experiment of combining cooperation and compassion. Susan, I know you're thank talking, you. there you go. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Marilyn, share share your perspective about this collaboration. Well, I, I think it's important to note that when the Charter for Compassion uh, actually got into gear, which was in 2014, 
Uh, we recognized that there were two levels that we needed to address. One was what our founder, Karen Armstrong, suggested as one city helping another city. And part of that idea um, was that we would look at issues that a city, one city might have, another might have. Um, and she called them grave. So the, and she also called that looking at the issues were looking at what really made a city or community hurt. And so when we started this, you know, we looked at uh, working with, and we did, we worked for a few years with the University of Kansas's uh, community group. They've been about this for 30 years. And we created a toolbox um, so that members of initially compassionate cities, and when we started, there were two, um, Seattle and um, Louisville. The mayor of Louisville challenged the mayor of um, Seattle and said, you know, I think we're a better compassionate city than you are until proven otherwise. And so not only did that put the compassionate cities into gear, but it also started the compassion games. So moving from um, competition to co-optation. And, you know, the thing about pro-social is that it has everything that we envisioned as being a part of our toolbox. So we decided very early uh, in the game uh, when we turned actually to the community at large, uh, we put it on Facebook and said, you know, what is a compassionate city? What do you need in order for um, a community, a city to be compassionate? And we ran that on online for nine months and we got all kinds of information from people out there and that helped us build uh, the toolbox. But when you look at pro-social um, and the principles that come out of Eleanor Ostra, the thing that you find is that, you know, there's a lot of common sense here. Um, and the common sense is basically uh, helping a community or group of people. So this doesn't have to only be for cities. It could be for an organization. Uh, it could be for a interfaith group or any number of entities. But the idea here is that there's no good housekeeping seal of approval, that it's really up um, to a group of people to decide what is it that they want to do. So they create um, the action plan. Um, they create, sorry, I never get anyone who calls me. And today uh, I'm getting calls. Um, but uh, let me get back to my train of thought. But so it's the community who decides what it is uh, that needs to be done. And how to set up uh, the parameters uh, and the boundaries of what needs to be done and actually even create the conditions and uh, which moves into all of the things that pro-social is, is about. So that when and if people on this call decide that they wanna be a part of the charter and, and pro-social's approach to helping with organizing whatever it is that you want to organize, uh, you're going to find that there's an awful lot of understanding about working with people who are in the process of setting up uh, their own goals for what they want to accomplish. That there are tools here uh, that can help you reach that goal, that there are there's a lot of knowledge about the, the tactics and strategies and pulling these things off, uh, if I can put that uh, into, uh, into parentheses. Um, and, and an understanding of the systems that you, you would be working with. Um, and in some cases in the past, probably confronting, but changing that language and changing the direction from confronting to collaborating with. Um, so the, these are the things that are part of really creating something that is workable, 
and I think very necessary, and at the same time, planning for stability uh, within any program that you want to be involved in. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. And I'll just share, again, my name is Susan Soleil. I have the great honor of working for both the Charter for Compassion and Pro Social World. I, I say that I get to play in both sandboxes. Part of uh, the decision to be deep in deep collaboration was to share a staff person. And I had been with the Charter for Compassion. Um, I was fortunate enough to be uh, the one chosen uh, to be the staff, the shared staff person. And so it has been, oh wow, eight, nine, ten months now. I've been working for both organizations, and I'm bringing the charters network and networks and hearts and ideas and toolboxes over into pro-social world and I'm bringing pro-social uh, tools, ideas and processes over into the Charter for Compassion. And it's kind of like having two different colors of paint and I'm kind of mixing them in the middle with the help of a whole bunch of, of team members um, from both organizations. So it's the most unique job I've ever had and I feel very fortunate. To, to be part of it, so thank you. Uh, I think that's about all the time we have for this bus stop. I feel like I'm driving the bus. Um, we are actually gonna now invite uh, three incredible people who are part of Compassionate Communities who have also been at some level or another involved with this experiment. And so if Marge and Lynn and Anne will come on and uh, I think, and I know that you need to go soon after. So if, if you want to be first talking about kind of your experience with this collaboration and what's going on with, with San Antonio and know that I do have the reports all teed up and I will put them in the chat when when you get to that. So it's oh, great. It's, it's all, um, thank you for being with us and tell us a little bit about you. Well, my name is Ann Helmke, and um, I work for the government, the city of San Antonio, but my role is as a liaison, both with the faith community, but shortly after I came into this role, San Antonio officially became a compassionate city in 2017. I think what I want to add to what you've heard already is that, you know, every community, every city comes into you know, kind of the compassionate city role or community in their own way. And, um, and, and that's part of the beauty of it. But um, the Peace Center in San Antonio was working using peacemaking skills for a couple decades almost. And um, when that's when we discovered the Charter for Compassion about 2009 or 10, and then started to work towards that in terms of community organizing and getting as many people involved uh, around that kind of work. And we spent a lot of time drawing circles. So uh, trying to explain to people what the work was about and how the work happened. And, you know, there's this circle of people and then there's another circle of people and then the circles of people and the circles and the circles. And so we spent a lot of time um, trying to describe how the the work would actually occur somewhat organically. Um, and we didn't always have quite the language to describe it, um, although it was working. And not only was it working, we were thriving and having great times. We talk about the benefits package being all the relationships and the amazing things that happened. So there was this kind of, or is this kind of spark that comes from the work that you then you know you're like in the zone, right? And so we worked that way. Um, and we found out later when we discovered ProSocial over a year ago that it was defined and described, but we just kept working collaboratively and um, until the city became official in 2017. And since then, 
um, in my particular role is to develop intentional collaboratives um, between all sorts of sectors in the community, business, education, healthcare, nonprofits, the faith community, um, anybody basically who's willing to work together towards the greater good and to meet um, you know, basic human needs, uh, especially um, contextually and where we find ourselves these days. But then about, uh, I serve on the, the board with the charter. And when we first heard about pro-social and it was being described, um, in five minutes, I'm like, that's what we do. That's how we, that's what we do. And to then recognize that the design principles that Lynn Ostrom came up with in her research in terms of her Nobel laureate work, um, it just, it just totally rang true. And so, um, I got really excited about that because we were growing here in many different ways. And we were in transition, growth transition in terms of that peace work, growing into compassion work and growing very large within our community and how we were going to do that. So we went through pro-social um, together as a team who were working on this transition. And that's kind of then what brought us to this point in time. And, and then it just got so excited that we partnered with ProSocial, both the charter and San Antonio and ProSocial. And so I don't know, Susan, if you wanna bring that up, I also have it queued up, but we did some research and even how we did the research was collaborative. And so uh, not only um, did we research five different collaboratives, we've got, a couple dozen collaboratives that are working right now, but uh, pro-social, you know, just sidled right up and, and we found local folks who volunteered uh, to be researchers. And uh, we researched together five collaboratives, the oldest of which was 30 years. I wanna stop there. You can see where it lines up. I, one, I love this, this graph a lot that says core design principles. I've never seen a graph like that, but I love it. And um, it lists there the, the principles from pro-social and then the research of the five different collaboratives from 30 years to about three months old. So I chose five collaboratives, actually I think it ended up being six, but that worked with different societal concerns and, um, but that they had been around for different periods of time, 30 years, 15 years, um, five years, three months. And so we were able to kind of do some comparison then. But this research has done so much for those of us who've been doing like peacemaking work and compassion work. Uh, we know that it can be perceived as soft um, and there's so much strength to it. And this kind of research has really helped to strengthen it, to give language to how we operate, but also to give story to our leadership, both our civic leaders, but also like nonprofits and businesses. And so it's just really assisted and given some, um, again, some valuable strength to the work because we're able to describe it and talk about it in different ways. So, thank you, thank you, Anne. I don't know if that's what you wanted me to share, but that's what I wanted to share. So. Excellent, that's what we want, what you, what's on your heart. Um, I did put the link to both the executive summary and the full report in the chat, so that those are there for anyone who wants to either save the chat um, or you can reach out to me after the fact and I'll send those to you. And commend them to you because you can learn a lot. The other communities can learn from that. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And if you need to go, I, I understand you're kind of stepped out of a, a meeting to be part yeah, of We're running a Compassion Institute right now. So yeah, I stepped out of that, but we're all good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mar um, Marge, do you want to go next? 
Thank you. So um, I'm, I feel like a new kid on the block. I so enjoyed hearing what Anne had to say. I'm going to be looking at her report. So uh, Compassion York Region um, is in part of Ontario, just north of Toronto. Um, I'm in Richmond Hill. Uh, we're a two tier government. So uh, the Re York Region has nine municipalities of which Richmond Hill is one. Richmond Hill has uh, officially declared uh, that itself, uh, the, the council, that it's a, a chart, uh, compassionate city. So we're working there. It's been a challenge in many ways. And that's why this, the, this tools, what pro-social offers is so important. Um, we, we started during COVID, which is an ideal time. The person that did start us, uh, she needed to step away because of work obligations. And I sort of, I sort of stepped up. It wasn't a you know, we didn't have a vote on it, it just happened. And so we need to work through that. So, but um, I, I I come from a role where uh, I connect the community. My business card says community connector. So I know a lot of people in the community and I struggle with how best to, uh, how best to connect them. And with now, uh, with the lens of compassion. I believe I always wanted to do that, but now I, I'm having more of the language, the skills to do that. So I feel like I'm in infancy. I've learned so much from Anne, uh, and uh, we'll we'll see what happens. So I really appreciate my being involved with uh, the charter, with the pro social. We did a focus group uh, with someone from uh, San Antonio, Texas, and that was amazing. Again, uh, someone who's been at this for a while. Uh, and uh, so it, it's um, it, it's been a very, very positive experience. Uh, I'm so looking forward to being part of uh, going to the uh, Parliament of Religions and actually meeting many of you people because that's going to be so, so positive. I think I will get energized, but also learn a lot as well. Fortunately, uh, the mayor of uh, Richmond Hill, you know, yes, he did sign the charter, but um, I've twisted his arm and he is coming. Uh, you know, he's... I, I'm not going to say uh, yeah, I'm, he was, he's a good friend. Uh, he's mentored me in photography. He's been on the board of trade with me. So I, I've known him for a while. So it wasn't that difficult to uh, convince him to come because I believe he really uh, does things with compassion as well. So um, we're just beginning on the journey. And uh, I am so thankful for uh, what Susan and uh, the rest of you have um, have have offered me so thank you so. thank you and thank you for being part of our focus group because uh we did two different focus groups with other communities or compassionate communities to kind of help inform kind of uh the next phase for our collaboration so thank you mark thank you lynn reader good morning to you joining from Ballarat, please talk to us a little bit about what you're doing and your compassionate um, action work. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you, Susan. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Lynn Reader. I'm um, here in Ballarat, which is just outside uh, Melbourne in Australia. Um, I've known Paul for quite a while and so very aware of the work that he's been doing um, on pro social and watching it as it's developed. Um, to give you a little bit of background in terms of what's happening in Australia with the Charter, uh, we have an Australian Compassion Council and uh, we're doing work at a national level. The main work we're doing um, is Deep Dreaming Australia, a continent for compassion. So that's honouring our Indigenous heritage um, through that deep dreaming. And we've got three main activities. One is our Compassionate Cities. One is our sectors uh, and then applying compassion through the sectors and then our national day of compassion um, which is always on the 21st of September so those three activities keep us very busy we're a fully volunteer group um, and then as so as well as um, being on the Australian group I'm also uh, on the um, compassionate Ballarat steering group so I was born here in Ballarat and um, have a long family history here. Um, so, uh, so the Ballarat City Council formally signed the charter in 2019. Uh, so we needed um, to do a little bit of work um, to support, you know, to bring them on, to, on board. Um, 
and for them to understand what, uh, what would be involved and how we uh, would support the community. And I think in doing that initial work with them, um, uh, we held a week of compassion uh, here in Ballarat and they were able to see that just as um, other global local initiatives such as creative cities, uh, smart cities, child-friendly cities, that really this work brings a global um, perspective to, but, but shows how it should be or could be um, uh, rolled out at a local level. Um, so the work that we've been doing here, as I said, is with um, a steering group, uh, fully volunteer. We've been very fortunate to have a, uh, a very senior people uh, from uh, from the community, and I think that's also helped the city engage. We had the head of police join the steering group, feeling that that was a, a compassion was a really important component that needed to be brought into into her work. Um, the hospital, of course, as well. So I was involved um, with the focus groups uh, initially uh, to, uh, you know, bring in what we were doing. Um, and then, so the way that I see the, the, the work of Compassionate Ballarat supporting um, or aligning, I suppose, with this partnership with ProSocial um, is that it frames, uh, helps us frame our work and we were able to bring um, people from both the, the national body and Compassionate Ballarat to uh, a workshop that Paul and uh, Robert Stiles ran and it was very helpful for us because we were able to um, ground our work. Um, we haven't done the amount of work that's been done in San Antonio. That's huge, and I really look forward to seeing that uh, report. Um, but uh, but in terms of going through the principles, um, for example, you know the um, shared identity and purpose. I mean that was really very uh, that reaffirmed. Um, that we were all on the same page, which is when you're in a, a community group and a, a volunteer group, um, we can't take for granted. So, um, so that was really important. And then, um, you know, again, agreeing on, um, uh, it was very reaffirming to have the fact that things like the reaffirming or agreed behaviours and those sorts of things were pretty much um, agreed. People felt that we we really were uh, very positive in our uh, the way we work together. And then self-governing, I think that was a really important, uh, one of the important principles that we applied to our work to see that we're really um, in a position to um, allow people to bring um, what they want to bring um, and their interests uh, to the work of Compassionate Ballarat. Um, for example, there's uh, one of our members very interested in um, uh, social justice and has done a lot of work um, to bring a sleep bus to Ballarat. Um, and uh, so that's supporting our homeless. Um, but the city also has been very supportive in, um, in working with us at, at a collaborative level. And one of the, just one, I'll just give you one example. Uh, they is since they signed the charter they've established within their youth awards every year they have youth awards that recognize the wonderful things that are happening across our city and they actually introduced um, a care and or a compassion and care award and that's been very um, well supported and a lot of um, kids have been sponsored uh, within that category so so we we find that the principles, give us a, a framework for, you know, to uh, ground our work and ensure that um, it's as uh, positive and support, you know, um, uh, yeah, positive as it can be. So thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And thank you for the work you're doing in Ballarat. I, I, I think one of the things that inspires me is just how uh, passionate about compassion your whole group is. And all of the time and energy that they give to making a difference in your community. Very inspiring. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
thank you, dear, lovely city, compassionate cities for that. Um, hello, Paul, I wanna welcome you here. And Marilyn, I wanna welcome you back. I know Marilyn, um, we were gonna give you just a little bit of time to talk about kind of some, uh, some of the needs that you see with compassionate cities and um, maybe possible ways that both the charter and uh, pro-social might be able to help. And then, and then Paul and I are gonna chat for a bit. Okay, so, uh, I think that, um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, it, it's interesting because there are so many ways. I, I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that we often say in the charter is bring people together who think like you. Uh, and as you begin that conversation uh, of likeness, uh, then begin to ask the question of, um, you know, who's not at the table uh, and who do we need uh, to bring? Then the next thing is who's doing great things um, in our community? So if, if we follow, you know, that kind of meandering road, I think what oftentimes happens is that, that people get stalled in, in inviting other people into the process. Uh, so, you know, if you are, if you always remain a like-minded group, um, uh, you're, you're spinning your own wheel. And so I think that, you know, there's an opportunity um, here where we can say, you know, how do you reach out? How do you diversify uh, the people who best represent uh, what you're trying to do? So that's an area. Um, where I think um, we need for our compassionate communities to think a lot more about. I think there's the compassionate listening uh, part of all of this. Um, you know, so often people join a group because uh, either knowingly or subconsciously, they're pushing their own agenda. And so how is it that through really intense listening to one another, uh, that they can actually hear uh, maybe the pain, the suffering, the angst, uh, the desires of other people. So I think that's, that's another really important uh, piece uh, to bringing about change in any organization or within a community. Another thing where, where I think um, our compassionate communities need some help, some advice, um, and some encouragement. And, and that is, you know, how do you bring about true collaboration? So um, in, in that, when I speak of collaboration, that means that, you know, again, not only the partners that you might bring into the process, but that shared sense of responsibility uh, regarding governing. So that, you know, how is it that a compassionate grassroots organization can really approach uh, a local government uh, so that collectively they can begin to work on the same things. Um, so I think those are the, you know, three really big um, areas of, of concern. Um, you know, it's probably if there's time uh, that some of the people on the call here who are from compassionate cities uh, can speak to some of you know, the, the needs that they, they might see that they've encountered that are, um, you know, part of, of their journey. Um, it's so interesting that so often people don't get out of that, you know, first or, or second step. Um, and the other thing is they don't oftentimes uh, take an opportunity to look around them in their own community to acknowledge uh, and support, I think is, is a really big word here too, support organizations that are doing extraordinary work already and simply asking the question, how can we help? Thank you. Those were great points. And I guess I found myself thinking about uh, the eight core design principles and pro-social tools and thinking about ways that they that they might and then obviously the great toolkit or the toolbox that's on um, the charter's website so those are all and I'll put those links in the in the chat here shortly so thank you thank you Marilyn mm -hmm. and you're welcome to stay on Paul if you'll join us please 
would love to chat about pro-social world and eight core design principles and anything else you want to chat about. <laughs> thanks so much, Susan. And thanks to uh, Marge and Anne and Lynn and, and Marilyn for all that you've had to say. It's been so inspiring. I mean, the first thing I want to say is that uh, pro-social world is just as excited about collaborating with the charter as, uh, as the other way. We see that there's huge opportunities um, in, in this collaboration for, for learning from one another. There's really strong alignment, I think, between our vision of what collaboration, deep collaboration looks like and compassion. I mean, in, in essence, what we're talking about is compassionate collaboration. It's a, it's a form of collaboration that um, respects individual self-determination, that really honors the authenticity and the values of individuals, but then weaves that together into a shared vision of something that is um, more human, really, than, than some of the forms of collaboration that we see in place at the moment that are more, more machine-like and more, and more coercive and so forth. So um, really, I think that uh, pro-social, in a sense, picks up where compassionate integrity training leaves off to some degree. I know that CIT has a, a systems component in it and they lead into that, uh, that, that work leads into there. But um, what we're doing in pro-social is really seeking to explore, as was mentioned earlier, in a, in a very um, contextualized, participant-led way, you know, how could we do collaboration in a way that's uh, more equitable, more inclusive, more transparent, more um, effective uh, in, in local communities. So that, that's one of the reasons why we're so excited um, about the collaboration. Uh, I might just briefly share, actually, Susan, would you like to speak about the course first and then we talk a bit about pro-social or would you, shall I, shall I introduce the model a little bit first? Uh, introducing the model first would be great. And I, I think talking about the eight core design principles and maybe even the spoke diagram, I have kind of those all teed up. So yeah. how, whichever um, order well, you want. Okay, great. What I might do is I'll just um I'll just share my screen. Um, I wanted to just um, jump in here. So let let me start with just introducing uh, some core processes. So you've got a bit of a sense of what pro social is about. As Jeff mentioned at the beginning, uh, what we're what we're about is uh, creating greater collaboration and trust in groups. And we're doing that by drawing upon a number of different sciences, um, the sciences of uh, evolution, cultural evolution in particular, and uh, Ostrom's work on commons and how communities can organize to share resources uh, in an equitable, egalitarian way. And also the science of behavior change, the psychology of behavior change, how you can help people to uh, clarify their own values, their own sense of what really matters in a group situation and create alignment between members of the group so that, uh, and then agreement around um, uh, what to do next. So one way to think about pro-social in a very practical way is in the terms of a set of core processes. Uh, that is, um, and it starts in individual self-development, just as CIT does. Uh, and so in a sense, what we're doing is picking up on, on some of those CIT skills in the course that we're planning to run next this year, we'll be essentially starting from that space of what really matters to the people that are in the room, as it were. We have, um, in addition to thinking about um, compassion, we have a notion of what we call psychological flexibility, which is the capacity to kind of um, stand back and look at any situation and identify what really matters to us here, even when it's stressful, even when it's a difficult, aversive situation, and kind of orient toward working toward what really matters, even when it's challenging. 
Uh, we also do a bit of work around communication and so forth, but you know, it may well be that for this course, uh, we're well down the track with that work. Um, then really there's this very practical process of envisioning shared purpose and identity. Uh, what, what's our vision for what really matters for this city, for this community? Uh, we make use of the core design principles to explore how do we work together to move toward what really matters. And then we uh, focus on skills for genuinely inclusive decision making and planning around uh, what to do next. And then, of course, this is a continuous process of uh, learning and adaptation. Now you've already seen the core design principles um, mentioned on that beautiful uh, report that Susan was so instrumental in creating for, for San Antonio. Uh, and indeed, you know, um, uh, of course, that was a very much a team effort, including Anne and many others. Um, uh, so the, um, our conversation around how do we want to work together to achieve our vision is oriented around these core design principles, which stem from work which actually earned Eleanor Ostrom a Nobel Prize in 2009. And her primary interest was in really questioning the, the orthodoxy of economics that um, the only way you can control people's selfishness is by having top-down regulation or private ownership. Uh, and uh, she was saying, well, actually, since time immemorial, human beings have been able to organize themselves uh, if they can come to agreements um, that reflect these core principles, uh, a sense of shared identity and purpose, a sense of equity, equitable distribution of costs and benefits of involvement, that people who are involved in decision making should, uh, sorry, people who are affected by decision making should be to the extent possible. And obviously this always depends on the context. There's many, many different approaches to this, but to the extent possible that um, people who are affected by decisions should be involved in the making of them. Uh, effective groups in her studies were also reasonably transparent. There was the capacity to see what others in the group were doing. There wasn't, you know, the, the idea of uh, uh, individualistic, selfish behaviour going on in the dark, as it were, because of the transparency of behaviour. Um, that there was, uh, there should be helpful uh, responding to helpful and unhelpful behaviour. So responding that encourages helpful behavior and discourages unhelpful behavior so that we're responsive to one another. And that includes uh, um, helpful approaches to conflict resolution, fast and fair uh, conflict resolution um, or re restorative practices. A key piece as, um, as some of the speakers mentioned is the essential, it, the, the need to um, provide individuals and groups with the uh, necessary authority to um, self-govern, but in the context of a broader system. So it's not that people are each doing their own thing or that groups are each doing their own thing. They're always cognizant of a broader system, but they have the necessary authorities to be able to implement those first six design principles uh, that they can actually create systems that are equitable and fair and transparent. And of course, the beauty of this work, of Ostrom's work, is the capacity uh, that she's created for this work to all scale up, um, to uh, refer to collaborative relations with other groups so that all we have shared identity and purpose between groups, equity between groups, fair and inclusive decision-making between groups. So I'll, I might stop there. We have lots of tools around helping to build all of that, but I really want to give Susan some space there to talk a bit about the course that we have planned. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And I think one of the things that I really appreciated doing the research with Anne and the team from San Antonio and the folks from ProSocial World was that the that number one group shared group identity and purpose 
was so powerful with all of these collaboratives. I mean, they knew why they were together. They knew what they wanted to accomplish. And they were, that actually kind of helped them get through whatever little bumps there were in the roads of being together for 30 years or for three months, right? They, they held together over those bumps because of that's, that was so strong, that first um, CDP. So, uh, and the heart, the, the compassion, it became almost like a glue that, that continued to hold these groups together. Um, love and compassion for each other, um, compassion for their community, uh, a desire to uh, accomplish a lot of great things together also helped them get through any sticky points. So I, I like that in the, and I'm not sure if that's spelled out in the executive summary, but it's definitely in, in the full report. So those links are there. Uh, so what we want to do, because we have very dynamic uh, people or cities here, and people from those cities that are, have been joined, have joined us, and we know that there are a lot of other cities that are in some process of uh, figuring out what they want to do, how they want to do it. And so the Charter for Compassion and Pro Social World, along with San Antonio, because Anne's going to help um, facilitate parts of this, we want to do a course. We want to do a course that will give tools to you to use as, and, and these tools actually that we've talked about, some of them are on the website and please use them. And maybe you don't need the course, you just need a couple tools and you're good to go and you're on your way. But there are others that might need uh, a little bit of uh, assistance. And so I'm going to pull up the flyer and share it and not even do it through the PowerPoint because I think it will be too small. And then, um, then I can make it big. So there we go. Um, we're doing a course in October. Is that big enough for everybody to see? I hope so. Um, where we're calling it the Compassionate Collaboration. It's a pro-social learning journey. And we are hoping lots of teams will join us and you don't have to be part of a compassionate community. You could be part of a grassroots organizing um, team and you want to bring other members with you to learn these tools and skills. Maybe you are a city planner or a city employee and you want to bring together a number of folks to also uh, increase your collaborative skills and, and uh, think about how to do it compassionately. So we have the benefits laid out. It's gonna be six weeks, 90 minutes each Zoom meeting. Um, it will be very interactive and we will ask folks to pick an action item and so that the team will be working on that through the course of our time together. Uh, let's see, course fee, 150 per person, group pricing, if there are six or more. My email is there, susan.soleil, S-O-L-E-I-L at prosocial.world. Please email me. I will stop sharing this. And I will let everyone know that if you, that all everyone who is here signed up, obviously, we will be sending you out an email with this information, with some links to this, the link to the recording and how you can join us if you are interested. Yeah. Oh, and all of my panelists all disappeared. Um, I'm kind of done. So I would like to bring everybody back and open it up to questions from the attendees. And let's see, I actually had one sent to me and it was wondering um, what kind of successes you have seen from collaboration, like really deep collaboration. So whoever wants to field that question first, feel free, maybe to, a couple people could answer that. I think I can chime in um, because I think we've seen a lot of success uh, around some of our communities that are part of the Compassionate Initiative. One of the very first to occur, I believe, was in Botswana, where the Compassion team decided that they were going to take on some very meaty problems, one which was corporal punishment that was occurring in schools and among families. Um, and they started to work um, 
with organizations in Kenya that were partners and in Canada. Uh, the Canadians uh, who sponsored the, the Kenyans uh, decided that, that they would help bring a team uh, to Botswana so that a train the trainer program could happen with social service agencies and teachers. The other thing, uh, because so many children were dying um, of um, uh, store-bought milk, um, there was a big campaign that we initiated with collaboration with La Leche Group um, and got them involved and a, a bush program of breastfeeding occurred uh, within uh, the country. So, I mean, all everything that they did initially in Botswana was really cooperating with one another, looking at the successes, not only within their own communities in their own country, but in neighboring countries as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to take that? For oh, yes, please, Paul. <laughs> well, I, I thought maybe uh, Marilyn just inspired me to think of an African example um, of uh, uh, just wonderful collaboration during the Ebola crisis, which predated COVID crisis, as it were, um, where there was a, uh, in Sierra Leone, there was um, a lot of people dying. Um, and part of the challenge was that people were spreading the disease by their burial practices, which involved washing and, um, and kissing the dead. And, uh, and that's an ancient, practice in those communities and, and was a really deeply valued piece of honoring the dead. And uh, there was a uh, collaborative process based around pro-social that was introduced, which um, uh, to cut a long story short, basically allowed for the expression of the, the tension between caring for and honoring our dead and also not wanting to get sick and pass it on to our families. And together, the community developed an approach together of um, uh, using a, a banana trunk as a substitute for the dead body and washing and kissing the banana trunk and then burying that. Very, very different approach to what had been introduced by the World Health Health Organization, which was to put everybody in body bags and these, you know, I've seen pictures of these awful body bags and so forth. Not to criticize the WHO, but it was, that's a, that's a bureaucratic response that didn't evolve from the community. And uh, once the community was able to evolve their own response, um, they were able to create a much more humane response. Um, uh, yeah, well, there's an example. We, I could also talk a little bit about some work we've been doing with the United Nations, but I might let uh, others speak. Thank you. I'm, I'm really hearing the, the value of local right, that the, the local people truly being involved in the solutions that are most meaningful and helpful to them. Yes, Marge, please. Okay, my example is so less grandiose, but um, I'm going to tell it anyway, just to inspire people. Uh, we uh, started, got two happy to chat benches. They're benches uh, that just have a plaque on the back that say, you know, sit here, if you would like to sit, if you, it's uh, addressing loneliness and isolation. It was a real collaboration with the city. The city says, what do you want to do? And we got, we got funding from a grant, a quick action grant from the Canadian Mental Health Association and United Way. And we got the city councillors involved. We got a lot of news agencies where I was on, I had my son out in Vancouver said, hmm, I saw you on TV and uh, it was quite good. So uh, very happy that it was such a positive thing. Uh, and we have had many cities uh, contact us about the idea. So nothing as impactful as what you've done, but it was a feel good, let's start uh, thing that I'm proud that I was part of. Thank you for sharing that. And really nothing is too small, right? Everything we do, changes, changes our cities, changes the way we see each other. So thank you. Yes, please, Lynn. Uh, so yeah, so again, uh, a small one, but um, one that we feel was very impactful was uh, each year we've been um, gathering stories uh, from 
our, school, our primary and secondary school students across the city um, of the actions that they do, compassionate actions. And some of them are just totally inspiring. And uh, so we've gathered them into a book um, and then we uh, make sure that book gets sent um, right around to all schools um, because the idea is that these children are really um, case studies in empowering behaviour. Um, I'll just give you one example, one young fellow at the beginning of a couple of years ago now, at the beginning of um, COVID and was concerned about his grandmother in aged care and, um, and not having a mask. And so rather than just going by, you know, some takeaway or, or throwaway mask, he taught at 12, he taught himself to sew. And he sews hundreds, and he ended up sewing hundreds of these masks, which were then distributed, not just through aged care, but through our soup bus to the homeless, even into prisons. Um, so they're very inspiring stories. We send them to our city councillors to ensure that they also um, mention them in their community um, uh, you know, just talks and all the all the you know incidental uh, meetings that they have. So we see that sort of snowball effect, um, but uh, very very much from that sort of collaborative. And and we did it with a school, and the school kids took responsibility for um, pulling the book together. And so it was very good. Mm. Oh yes, thank you, Sue. <laughs> so that's the Compassion Heroes book. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so a, a question that came through is, what are some of the challenges of this kind of deep collaboration? I don't know if you want to mention anything, Jeff, or if anyone else has, uh, I mean, this, this is a really deep kind of collaboration between two organizations that are trying to kind of blend lots of things. What what are some challenges there? Well, I'll just say the, the challenges are contextual um, and you don't necessarily know what they are until you get in and, and explore deep listening and, and uh, begin to explore what matters most. Um, and one of the things that we have is uh, one of the tools that come out of contextual behavioral science, something called the ACT matrix that is a tool to help groups understand what's valuable to them individually, what's valuable to the group, what direction that they wanna move in, and what are the things that protect them from doing that or prevent them from doing that. So it really um, helps us to uncover things that are going on in our inner experience, thoughts and feelings that you don't necessarily know Sometimes we don't even know ourselves, and we certainly don't know what's going on in other people's hearts and minds. But what happens is that using this tool, everybody begins to understand the things that are hooking them and the things that are hooking others. And then also the things that they share profoundly in common where they can support each other in these things. So, um, uh, the, the things that are the challenges often are the things that are hidden. And if those things can be made visible, then you can work with them. And, and so it's going to be different for, and there's always challenges, obviously, because, you know, if cooperation was easy, everyone would be doing it. But um, it can be much easier with the right kind of tools and the right kind of process. That's how I'd answer that. Thank you. Thank you. I just realized we have just a few minutes left. And I, I was reading that birds that are part of murmurations are watching and in tune with the seven closest birds to them. And that is how they are able to move in ways that they, they never knock each other out of the sky. Um, and yet they make these incredible patterns and, and move up and down and into fields and into trees with, with um, such a plum. So um, I actually have seven people here and I want to make sure that, or there are seven of us. And so I just wanna close out and let everyone say just a few few words as we are, are ending um, about anything about collaboration or compassion, about communities, 
about our desire to change the world. And I think before you end, actually, there's a question in the chat box, oh, which is quite interesting. So, okay. Shortly. Well, how could you see ProSocial helping a city's new city council members and mayor establish trusting working relationships amongst themselves? Mm, in Seattle. Um, great question, Steve. Anyone want to take that in the in 30 seconds or a minute? Maybe, maybe that's a, a question, Steve, that uh, Marilyn and I can chat with you. Yeah, we'd love to chat, um, Steve. I think that's a bigger question that can be answered in 30 seconds. But yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'd just like to say something about the, the challenges question as, as, by, as a way of closing. I think one of the big challenges is that we swim in a culture that has had at least six decades of emphasizing individualism and competition and uh, and these things have seeped into our minds and our hearts at such a deep level that we've lost a little bit of the capacity to dream of a better world. And I want to extend my appreciation to the Charter and to all of you that are attending for holding on to that kernel of, um, you know, that the world can be better, even in the face of the news and the skepticism and the accusations of naivety when we when we try when we put our heads up and and say it can be better so you know onwards and looking forward to the collaboration we're doing here that's my check out thank you thank you paul Merida, do you want to say a word or two as we exit thank you i'm just fascinated by the work done both by charter for compassion and, and pro social and i've find these webinars extremely interesting where we can actually come together and see what is happening um, in those different cities. So my congratulations to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, do you want to say a few words? Well, just profound gratitude to the Charter for Compassion and the work that it's done for a number of decades here and for the cities and communities that are embodying these principles uh, to make the world a better place. I uh, hope that we can be of service somehow and help you do even more of what you are doing collectively together. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn, and then we'll let Marilyn. So and just yeah, um, one thing in terms of um, this, uh, lo uh, local councils. One um, report we've just done recently is on compassionate social infrastructure and giving ideas to councils for how they can bring communities together. Um, uh, you know, really sort of um, uh, on the ground uh, examples that that are easily um, yeah implemented. So that's something that we're doing at the moment. Thank you. I'll make sure I get your contact over to Steve so that he can connect with you about how you're doing that in Ballarat. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Marilyn, you get the final word. I think that, you know, everything that's been said has been grand. Um, but one thing I'm always struck by is how excited people are to hear at whatever level they're working at from other people who are doing the same thing in other cities, other communities, even not only nationally, but internationally. And to partially answer Steve's um, you know, idea about how do we bring this forward, uh, we get another mayor <clears throat> somewhere uh, to convince the mayor of Seattle that the council needs to do this kind of work. And I think we have another uh, a number of mayors uh, who would do that. Uh, so it's just one answer out of many, I think. You actually, that's the seven birds, right? The mayors kind of coordinating with the mayors. So okay. thank you all so much for being part of this. Um, what a joy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for all of the attendees. Thank you to all of the panelists. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.